Um, so we are going to start the concluding forum on the Civil Rights Movement Initiative. I spoke about it yesterday. So um, in 2015, I had the pleasure to um, start the program and partner with my alma mater, Hope High School. I uh, graduated the class of 07. Um, there's two from the class of 2016. And then the last three are going to graduate this year. Um, so I will quickly um, read their bios and let you tell them, uh, let them tell you about their experience. Um, so to my right is Hafsat Akani. She's a rising junior at Boston University, majoring in international relations and minoring in African, African American studies. Um, she was born in Lagos, Nigeria, and raised in Dublin, Ireland. Um, Hafsat has spent the last four years living in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, the city where she developed her passion to combat social injustice. Um, during her senior year at Hope High School, she was able to participate in the first Civil Rights Movement Initiative cohort at Brown University. Um, and her work with CRMI inspired her to bring the program to Boston University this year. Um, and next year, Hafsat will be serving as Boston University Student Body Executive Vice President. And she is an aspiring civil rights advocate who experiences, whose experiences over the last year have strengthened her determination to help those around her. Um, to the right of half that is Jessica Doe, who is a rising junior at the Rhode, at Rhode Island School of Design, where she is studying apparel design. Um, she is a Providence native and a Hope High School alum. During her time at Hope, she also had the opportunity to uh, be a part of the first cohort of the Civil Rights Movement Initiative. Um, while a part of this program, she developed a vital understanding and interest in African American history. Um, this interest has in influenced her study at RISD, where she independently writes research papers about the history of black representation in commercial film and the role of costume in these films. Um, she hopes to incorporate this passion into a costume collection that explores the intersection of her Haitian and Nigerian American identity during her senior year. Um, to the right of Jessica, we have Sarah Jackson, who is currently a senior at Hope High School, co-founder of the board of directors, editor of the school newspaper, Wavy News, and volunteers at Planned Parenthood every Wednesday. Sarah will attend Providence College this fall, majoring in English education. Um, to the right of Sarah is Mohamedou Mbeyi. He is currently a senior at Hope High School. He is a reading teacher and community data teacher at Breakthrough Providence. Um, at Rhode Island He's a part of Rhode Island College Upward Bound program and a part-time worker at Subway. Mohamedou will be attending Boston College this fall. Um, and we'll be studying management and the concentration of accounting. And lastly, but certainly not least, is Imani McDaniel, who's also a senior at Hope High. And she's a part of yearbook, newspaper, and the board of directors, student council. She also finds the time to work a few days after school. After graduating, she will be attending the University of Rhode Island in the fall, where she will major in business with the plans of one day owning her own photography company. Um, so please join me in welcoming this year's uh, the last three cohorts of the Civil Rights Movement Initiative. Um, so one of the questions that we um, posed to the panelists was to reflect on their experience in the program and think about what they learned and how it shaped their development. So in any order, you guys can start. Any order. Okay, I'll be good. Um, so I was part of okay. Um, I was part of the for, the first cohort of the Civil Rights Movement Initiative, and sort of looking at my experiences now and looking at where I am today, I don't think that I understood the value of the program, of the trip, of everything that we were doing until like now. Um, in Reflecting on the trip and reflecting on the program, I felt very privileged to be able to understand and learn um, the history that I wasn't fortunate enough to learn in the classroom. Um, and then go on the trip and then see all these sites of memory and see all these different, all these different events that happened and actually be there in the physical spaces that they happened in and sort of understand how much meaning and how much goes into sort of remembering the history that we've been told. Um, it was through the program that I finally decided that I wanted to 
minor or major in um, African or African American studies. Um, after learning about the program and learning about my history, it was difficult to unlearn it or not know it. And I think just knowing it motivated me to get more work, get more involved in work of social justice and social advocacy. Um, now at Boston University, I'm in my finishing my second year, um, and one of the things that I'm learning is kind of the way that we remember and the way that we memorialize history and the role that museums play into that. Um, throughout Sierra Mai this year, I was very, I was very, very moved by it, and I so I wanted to uh, start a Boston University chapter, sort of emulating what Maya did here with us at Brown, and bring it to BU. And this year, I worked with students from Boston Latin Academy, teaching them the same way I was taught. And then we also went on our own trip. And one of the things that kept coming up was sort of the roles that museums play in memorialization and creating and preserving the history that we've learned and the history that we know. Um, and in particular, one of the examples was when we went to Montgomery, Alabama, and we went to the Rosa Parks Museum. Um, and you know, looking back at myself in 2016, you know, going to the museum and learning about Rosa Parks, I would have been really excited, and I would have been like, "Wow, you know, Rosa Parks is really good." She said no, you know, but kind of just knowing what I know now and learning from classes and seeing that Rosa Parks was militant. Rosa Parks was. You know, she was a follower of Malcolm X. Rosa Parks' grandfather would sit on his porch every night with a rifle ready for KKK members to attack. It sort of made me feel a certain type of, kind of what like Professor Augusta was saying earlier on, like a distrust for academia um, and feeling that I hadn't learned my full history and seeing the ways that museums had a, a role to play in that. You know, at the beginning of, when you walk into the museum, there's a video that plays. And it's about Rosa Parks and how she was properly dressed and how she sat down very peacefully and how she said no, but it doesn't show you the complexity of the woman Rosa Parks was, if I'm making any sense. It doesn't show you sort of what goes on behind the scenes and what goes or what happened behind the movement. So it leaves the visitors of the museums with this one narrative of who Rosa Parks was and it doesn't make her, it doesn't add to her complexity at all. So sort of the move, you know, participating in the civil rights movement as you have like, has motivated me to sort of do more research and understand and look outside of the textbook and look towards other opportunities like speaking to activists and speaking to veterans and seeing how or what is missing from those history textbooks and what's missing from the classroom and how we interpret um, what we see and what we learn. Um, so when I did the program, I had very like ambitious um, ideas of where it would take me. Um, I perceived it as the beginning of this very um, like deep desire to learn more about African American history. But even bigger than that, I wanted to learn about um, the diaspora, which was just very, very ambitious and not specific at all. Um, and being in an art school and this is kind of like the first time I'm getting to focus on um, just me as an artist and figuring out what activism means within that. And that's something I'm still trying to figure out. But um, on the side, like I've been trying to get that like um, more of this knowledge going and trying to take classes whenever I can about um, artists specifically like Afro-British uh, artists, um, African-American artists that I can really draw experience, it, like influences from and really just apply it to my own work, which is now costuming. Um, so I think I'm still trying to figure out where CRMI is kind of guiding my, my studies and, and where it will take me, um, something I think a lot about. Um, I think that when I first went on the trip, um, I feel like like even like months after the trip, we went in January and like I'm still getting like different feelings about it every single, like not every day, but like something happens and it's like reminds me of the trip or I go back to the trip. And um, I think that, that that just means that it'll be a part of like my life forever. And I feel like when I went on the trip, I wasn't expecting that. 
like um I knew it was going to change me because I was really reluctant to go on the trip in the first place. I feel like um I knew how unaware I was of my own history. Like as an African American female, I really didn't know anything besides the basis that I learned in elementary school and you know, MLK, Rosa Parks, um Malcolm X, boom. That's all I really knew. And I think that um I was reluctant to learn more because it was like you don't it's really hard to kind of accept your ignorance and move past your ignorance. So um, I knew that me taking that step forward and kind of like um, giving myself this knowledge, um, it was going to change me. But I didn't realize, um, you know, months after I'd hear something, someone say something about like Edgar Allan Poe and oh wait, that's that Ed, Edgar Mevers. And, um, you know, and kind of just I'd like instantly go back to where I was when I first learned about him, which is when we were on the bus and we watched the movie about him. And you know, you think it's gonna be this long, boring movie and you're sitting there and you're learning about this guy that you knew nothing about. And it's like, oh my goodness, like how did I not know about this person who fought, you know, for his rights and died for for my rights, you know? And um, I think that that's kind of what's been impacting me a lot is that you know, I hear people talk about the civil rights movement and I hear them talk about the same people over and over again. And like the trip kind of broadened my view to like, it's not just those three Rosa Parks, MLK and Malcolm X. And um, that's, I feel like the more I learn, the more it opens my eyes. And the more I want to tell other people like, no, there's so many other people. Like even Rosa Parks wasn't the first person to say no to getting off the bus, you know? So, um, I think that's that was the biggest impact for me, how how much my knowledge was broadened and how I really want to like let other people know about the people that are unknown, I guess. Um <coughs> sorry. So like um originally I joined the CRMI program because like simply because like I wanted something to do after school. So yeah. I wasn't doing anything at the time, so I was like, oh, yeah, this is a, this seems pretty cool. And like, I wasn't really that aware of what the program was going to bring until I did the workshops with Maya. So like, after the workshops, I was like, oh, yeah, this is definitely like something really important that like our school district doesn't really like touch upon. Because like, all about black history I knew was like, oh, yeah, slavery happened, and then there was Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. But that was about it. That that I was being taught. So like, I went on like this trip. Not even before the trip. I guess I was like kind of like naive to like social issues. Like I knew they were happening, but I was like naive to them. Like for example, I'd be like, oh, maybe it wasn't racism. Maybe like it was another factor or something. But then I realized like, yeah, we can't just like you know give them give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And I remember one workshop with Maya. Um, she she asked me this question. She was like. If I was to be in a neighborhood with a cop as a black man, would I be scared? And I said no, and Maya flipped. She was, <laughs> she was like, oh, you're a young black man in America, and you wouldn't be scared near a cop? And I was like, oh, no, as, as long as I know I'm not doing anything wrong. And then Maya said, well, so do you think Trayvon Martin was doing anything wrong? Or like, you know, all these other people, they weren't doing anything wrong. So I was like, oh, like, I didn't let her know this because then she, she was gonna think that she won the argument. So, <laughs> but in, <laughs> no, but in my head, I was like, oh wow, yeah, she's right. I mean, she's not right, but yeah, <laughs> but like these things are happening to people that like don't, aren't, like just happen to be at like the wrong place at the wrong time. So it's like, even if you are doing the right thing, you know, these issues are like, like I guess barriers for like a lot of like a freedom and stuff like that. So basically, so then when I went on this trip, like, I guess I was still partially naive because like I didn't really know much about it. So then like I remember like one of like the deepest points of the trip was I think it was one of our it was our first stop actually in North Carolina and um, they took us to this place where it was like I forgot what it was called but they basically showed us like the negative side of the civil rights movement because like they were all, always talking about like all oh, all how the activists fought for us and all that. But they took us to this room where it was like, they turned the lights on and all you see is like KKK uniforms and like a sign that's like, we sell slaves by the dozen and all that stuff. So I was like, that's that kind of like, from that point, the trip was like, it was like something different to me. I was like, yeah, this, this is like not something we should be ignoring. So <clears throat> even after the trip a little bit, reflecting back on it, like all the places we went, 
Like, I just, like, it made me want to be involved in social justice a little more. So, like, even, like, in my, like, school and career choices, because, like, I always wanted to do something math-related, but, like, this trip, like, had me contemplating, like, going to law school maybe or, you know, something like that. You know, just, like, to be involved in social justice and everything like that. Yeah. So, for me, before the trip, I feel like I had very little knowledge, like, on civil rights history. And joining the trip, I just wanted to like learn more about history because I've always liked history growing up. And like I wanted to travel through the states when like Maya came to my class saying, oh, you're going to go through all these states. So I was like, oh, cool. But then actually like after doing the workshops and learning more about the history, I didn't realize how much like it would impact my life. And then going on the trip, like realizing how different things are down south, even though we're, it's the same country, like it feels like in a completely different place. And it was like, it was a culture shock seeing like, going to Money, Mississippi and seeing just land for miles and miles and how there was nothing there because I've always grown up, I've grown up in the city. So like, it was really different for me seeing like the way things were, like how people could live like that. I don't know, it was just, it was very different for me. And like visiting the, talking to the activists and hearing their stories, like it connected me to them. And like knowing what they went through, it made me really think about the history and like I should be grateful for things that I have today, like my education, because back then like schools weren't integrated and the, um, like the, people of color weren't allowed to get the same education. And it made me really appreciate like what I have now because of what the activists did back then. Um, so going off of some of the things that people have said, Hafsat, you talked about what was missing and left out. Um, and then also keeping um, in with the theme of the conference, race, memory, and memorialization. I wonder if you guys can share um, a person that you've met or a site that you went to that stuck out to you that changed the way you thought about the civil rights movement and why? Um, one person that I, I immediately thought of when you said that was um, Sybil, Sybil Jordan. Jordan. Um, Hampton. Yeah. Hampton, thank you. I only don't remember her first name. But um, I think that throughout the trip, I was struggling with like, um, from the very beginning, like. I don't. I wouldn't think in that situation I'd be able to go to the protest and like risk my life and you know do the do the physical stuff where like me sitting there getting hit and not doing anything back. Like I was like I don't think I'd be able to put myself in that situation, you know. And um, and I felt like a coward like saying that because you know you're hearing all these stories about the brave kids, you know, the the little kids who marched and got attacked by dogs, and you know you're hearing about the adults who risked their jobs, and you're hearing like these stories about people who risked everything for their rights and I'm sitting here like having my rights and still like I don't think I'd be able to do it. So I felt like a coward and um, I think when I met Sybil, um, it really helped me because one thing she said is that not everybody fights the same way. So she said she fought through education. She was like, I went to school. I, I didn't go to any of the protests, but I fought through education. I like made sure I got my education because that's not what they wanted me to get. And like not saying that I wouldn't ever go to protests because I do go to protests, but like I think that seeing that there's another way to, you know, to stand up for what you believe in really helped me kind of come to terms with like, you know, not everybody can behave the same way. And like in the civil rights movement, that was another part of like, you know, not knowing everything because all you hear about is like the people that like were very active in it but you don't hear about the background people you know the people that weren't weren't on the streets but were in the courts but and like weren't on the streets but were in the schools and um i think that that really changed the way i even viewed the entire civil rights movement because it's like um you know not everybody was um um I'm okay you know I'll go. Um, when you ask the question of, you know, is there a, a place or a person, um, I immediately thought of the Equal Justice Initiative um, in Montgomery and how when we went there, we were, we were brought into this room and we were told the story of a man called Anthony Hinton. Um, so for those who don't know, the EJI's Equal Justice Initiative is a pro bono law firm that um, served to help exonerate wrongfully incarcerated citizens. 
Um, and Anthony Hinton was one of the victims that was wrongfully incarcerated, and he was put on death row for almost 30 years for a crime he did not commit. Um, and hearing his story and hearing about the work the EJI did for him, it sort of just reminded me that like history is continuing to transcend itself and kind of embed itself in different ways and how a lot of people have this misconception that the civil rights movement was it. You know, we fought the battle during the 1950s and 60s and now we're finished and now we can live life in this post-racial society where, you know, everyone is equal, you know? And hearing about Anthony Hinton's story and hearing about why he was locked up for 30 years um, and about how, you know, the police officers who arrested him were like, you know, it doesn't matter if you committed the crime or not, you're going to be convicted. Why? Because you're black, because you're poor, and because you, le you live in the Deep South. Um, and then learning, you know, so being on that trip and seeing Mr. Hinton and then kind of doing research of my own and understanding that, like, Rhode Island is one of the states that, you know, you can, as a young person, an eight-year-old can be incarcerated um, because we're not, like, we don't have the laws to protect us against those type of things. And hearing that there are multiple other states and just understanding that, like, my home state, Rhode Island, in New England, in the North, where we're supposed to be, you know, less racist in the North, like, for committing a crime, as a young person, you can be convicted and tried and put in jail. It didn't rest easy with me. So sort of that's one of the things that stuck with me. And maybe that's why I'm pursuing a career in law or I don't know why, but just understanding that a lot of these injustices are still taking place and to kind of reconstruct the narrative that the civil rights movement was it and to understand that there's still so much work that needs to be done is, it makes me think a lot. I remember um, we went to Mississippi and we went to the Freedom Project. Rosedale Freedom Project. Rosedale, Project. yeah, Rosedale. And we went to the like the the Freedom School. That's what they called it. Yeah. So <laughs> over there, there was like it was like a very like kind of like a poverty poverty struck stricken struck oh, a lot of poverty over there. Mm -hmm. And um, there was we went to this place where it's like an after school program kind of for kids where like they had to get bussed over there from like different cities or whatever and they all came there to like you know learn and do projects and all that so like basically we were like talking to the kids and they were telling us their story and how they like a lot of them have to walk like a, a lot like a long distance to go to school and stuff like that and we spoke to this one girl who was like oh in my school the teachers beat us if we misbehave and like i've never witnessed like i've never been beat at school or anything like that so i was like and that's something like Cause like, I come from African origin, so like they would always tell me stories about oh back in the day you used to get beat at school and whatever. But I didn't know that that still existed now. So like when they said that, like it kind of shook me. And then I was, and then I think it might have been Sarah who asked, or they were like, oh, what do you do when they beat you? And then the girl was like, oh, we don't do anything because we don't want to risk our education. So I was like, these kids are like getting like punishments and beatings for like little things. Whereas, like, us here in, like, Rhode Island, are, like, I've seen so many kids being ungrateful for education. Like, they have much more resources than these people in Rosedale, but they choose, like, not to come to school or they choose, like, you know, to, while they're in school, just do whatever they want. Whereas, like, these people are taking advantage of every little chance they have because they don't have that, as many chances as us. So, like, that kind of shook me as well. And, like, it made me realize how ungrateful, like, kind of ungrateful our society is, especially, like, to our like the younger ages. So like after hearing that, it kind of like made me think like, oh, what are, what are we like, you know, what are we really doing here? Like what, are, what, what, and also what can we do to like spread the word, like to show people that they should be thankful for what they have. And like also, yeah, in that city, like they said that there was like, like two or three high schools, I think, and then one of the students was like, oh, now they're making all those three high schools and shoving them into one. So it's like, you're getting like thousands and thousands of kids all into one school. So it's like, the resource, even if they, the little resources they have are gonna be even more limited because you gotta, you know, there's more people. So it's like, their education system is like pretty bad. And then a lot of them said like, their teachers aren't really even there to teach. Like, these were like middle school kids saying it too. Like, they were aware of the issue that like, most of their teachers were there, like, you know, just to get the check at the end of the month or whatever. And, like, they didn't feel like they were being taught correctly. Whereas, like, here, even in Hope High School, 
like a lot of people don't even appreciate the teachers. Like we'll complain that we get two homeworks a night instead of one or something. Like it's I don't I don't see like why. Yeah, I don't see why that that's a thing over here. Whereas there in Rosedale, people the kid the students don't even have a chance to like get the proper education. Um, so for me, one place that I think about is um, Medgar Evers um, Historic House Museum. Um, basically, we just visited his house and saw, because he got shot in front of his house, right? He got shot in front of his house and the bullet went through his house, through the walls, through the fridge. And just like walking through his house and seeing where his family lived and his children's bedroom and just it was a normal house where people live and just realizing uh, the kids heard his father get shot in front of his house and saw the bullet go through the rooms. And it just, it really hits you because you think about it, like what if that happened to you, like in front of your house, like your father got killed. And usually hearing about things like that that happen, you feel really disconnected to it because like you don't know the person, you don't know anything about them. but like actually walking around his house and made me feel connected because I was actually there and I could experience it for myself. And it just made me think about now, like hearing about the stories where like teenage boys get shot and all these things that happen. And we don't really think about it. Like when Trayvon Martin got killed, like everyone, like it was crazy for everyone thinking about it. But then as soon as they said how old he was and how he was just walking with Skittles and um, in Arizona, like you think about what if that was me walking down the street, just walking with my snacks, talking to my boyfriend or my girlfriend on the phone. Like it really makes you think like um, how bad society is today. Like you have to, some people have to worry about just getting killed on the street when for me, I'd never really thought about that before until like learning about that history and just how things could just happen like that. Um, one place I remembered, um, we, we were talking, when we had our panel, we were talking about like breaking moments and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember like the place I, I was thinking about was um, where MLK got shot. Cause I was very like throughout the trip, I was very hesitant on going. And when we met the activists, like I appreciated those moments, but I was just really like towards the end, I was really just kind of dreading being in that space because I felt like that would be the moment where like I just was just crying and bawling. And um, I think that moment came like way before. <laughs> moment came way before um, as we were learning about um, this man who what came from Senegal and he wanted to provide for his family, but he got like wrongfully killed like on his way home from work. And I, I remember like sitting down that night when we all had congregated together and we were talking about it. I just couldn't even, I couldn't even finish my words. Like I was just, just crying and just getting really emotional about it because I just was like kind of relating and thinking about my family who had come here. Um, both sides from Nigeria and from Haiti coming to, to create a better life for th life for themselves and it just really broke me. Um, can you guys re or connect issues during the civil rights movement to today's struggle for freedom that you notice things that are similar from what you learned about the civil rights movement and now? Um, I think that it's it's kind of a broad view, but um, one thing that I've realized is that, um, you know, race is still there. <laughs> I feel like there's some people where it's like, like when I say, like, that's racist, they're like, it's, you always think it's about black, like it's always black. You know, everything's not about black. And I'm like, it is though. Like, I mean, if I still have friends who tell me stories about them walking around the store and a clerk following them in the store just because they're black, like, it's it's that's what it is and i feel like um it's it's crazy that you know we're in 2018 and i still like have to consider did they do that to me cuz i'm black you know i think that if that question goes through your head i think that's like we'll never get past any of these problems until we stop think if until we can even not even consider you know is it because i'm black like for example um i do a school newspaper at my school and um 
I'm the editor on it, and we have a featured artist. And one of the kids, he wasn't even black, he was um, a Spanish kid, um, and he's, he doesn't speak English or anything, and he drew this picture, and it was, um, to me, when I first looked at it, it was just a, it was like a fruit-shaped picture. It looked like you know, it looked like a monkey, but it was fruit. And um, my librarian, she's African American, and um, she she's not the librarian, but she works in the library. And she looked at it, and she was like, "That is so racist. I can't even." Like she was really upset with me because she said it. It looked to her, it looked like. Um, those depictions of what African Americans were, you know, those those monkey pictures with the big lips and the and the big eyes and the pale, you know. So she was like, that that's too reminiscent for me. And I was like, but I don't understand. Like for me, looking at it, all I see is a fruit picture. And she was like, but you have to understand, sweetie, it wasn't that long ago that this is what we would see. So you have to think about my generation and this is what we would see. And I just had a click moment and I was like, I mean, I learned about that with Maya, you know what the cartoon pictures and you know and all those depictions of African American arts to kind of bring us down and like even though for me my first instinct isn't that but the fact that you know people still will look at a picture like that and see that African American depiction you know the derogatory um version of them I think that um that that's kind of what I have to come to terms with still and what a lot of people do and I think that's the biggest problem and I don't really know like what to do to solve it. I feel like it's really just a generational thing. Like it's been, it's, there's still people alive who experience that. So I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna be saved by like people saying we should all be equal. So I, I, I don't know. I just think that that's, it's still like a huge problem today. Like in the fact that I can experience it through someone that I see every day is kind of like, it kind of hurt, like hit me really hard, you know? Um. <clears throat> So when I first started the program with Maya, I also just started um, doing Breakthrough Providence, which is like where I teach the class at. So like, it would basically be like on Wednesdays I'd go to Breakthrough Providence, whereas like I like kind of self-teach myself like about um, immigration in Rhode Island, in sorry not Rhode Island in the United States, because then I would have to teach those to my teach that to my middle school students. So like I'd learn about I would learn and teach about immigration while I was the next day I'd come learn about Black history. So I, like it was a pretty like interesting time. But like like when Maya was asking about like current events, like I was kind of I was really passionate about the immigration thing because like my class was community data basically. So we were teaching them about like how to analyze data to like debunk stereotypes about you know. M mostly Hispanics, but like also every every other type of immigrant. So then we were mostly focused on DACA, the Deferred Action of Childhood Arrivals. So in that class, we were teaching the kids about it, and like the kids were like, most of them were Hispanic themselves, and they were, you know, kind of, at first they were kind of like, you know, pretty pissed off, not at us, but like at like what we were teaching them, like, oh, this is th these are the like, you know, misconceptions of immigrants in, America and even in, and we even went deeper I mean closer to thinking of just Rhode Island and like the kids were interested in everything so like so then when my asked about current events I was that's what came to my head because like it's just this idea of like not really being welcome in America unless you're like you know like like yeah unless you're white <laughs> but like a lot of people not even like because like most people think of the civil rights movement and think you know that's like a, mostly a black movement, but it's like it's not only us black people like who, who suffer from it. Like you know, Hispanics, Middle Easterns, Asians, all of that. So it's like I kind of even like learning about it because I'd have to learn about it each week, you know, just to refresh my memory so I can teach it to my kids. I sometimes get frustrated at like the you know immigration laws and all that stuff. So like it was kind of like I felt like I was doing a good thing by like. Uh, making the middle school students aware of it, but like I was trying to think of a ways to like solve it when I just couldn't, I couldn't think of any ways. And like, I like, I was proud of the middle schoolers, like the process, the progress they did. Cause like even one of the other classes in Breakthrough Pro Providence, like wrote an actual letter to the White House, like just to show like how they were passionate about like immigration laws and statuses. And like, they got a letter back and everything, but like they still felt like they weren't, they weren't being heard. So it was like, I was just thinking of ways to like, how can we make this better? Cause like, it's not just us black people, it's also every other race too. 
So we visited Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, where the Little Rock Nine first integrated the school. And walking through the school, like we walked through a small part of the school, and I noticed that like 90 percent, 80 or 90 percent of the students are people of color. So we were talking to the tour guide, and someone asked, so the school's integrated now, right? And she laughed, and she's like, no. And we're like, what do you mean? Like most of the students here are like people of color. And she said, it's integrated with students, but not with the classes, because she told us that in the AP courses, it's mostly white students, and um, not many of the like black students are in those classes because of the middle schools that the students go to. So it's segregated between like smart kids and like the uneducated kids. So it made me realize that like even though most of the students there are people of color, it doesn't matter because they don't get the same education that the white students do in that school. Kind of um, adding on to your point, um, earlier on in the semester, uh, I was in class and we read about an article about how Georgetown University, um, they had like evaluated their buildings and lands and they wanted to give reparations to the families of the slaves who helped build the university. Um, and as a part of that, a part of the reparations, what they were offering was for the students to be able to come to Georgetown University and go to school for free. Which at first when I heard about it, I was like, whoa, this is super cool. All these people from like Mississippi and Tennessee who like don't have money to go to college can go to Georgetown for free. And then I sort of, you know, thought about it and I was like, there's a lot of disadvantages that come to the advantage that they're trying to put on um, this new upcoming generation. You know, like, first of all, who says I want to go to school at a university where my ancestors got beaten, where my ancestors had to like literally, you know, through like, you know, through everything they had to build up this university. Who wants to say that I want to be at, in a classroom and listen to this? But then also the economic disparities that come with going to a school like Georgetown, especially if you're disadvantaged and especially if you are from, you know, Rosedale or from Sunflower County, Mississippi, and you haven't necessarily been equipped with the tools in order to sort of succeed at a PWI, at a predominantly white university like Georgetown. So sort of evaluating the roles that like, like in terms of like current events, evaluating the roles that uh, private and public universities and the government have to play in the education of students because it's great that you can go to college and learn all these things, but if you haven't been trained from the bottom, if you haven't been taught the skills that you need in order to be able to succeed at a well-known or you know prominent university, then what's the point of going to a, stu a school like Brown, a school like Boston University? When you get there, you're not going to be able to compete with the students in your class, right? You know, I have classes with students, I think, you know, like I have classes where I'm the only black person, I have classes where you know, there are international students who drive Lamborghinis on campus, and I have classes with people who have been going to private school since they were in kindergarten, right? So to talk of someone who didn't have much and who wasn't as fortunate enough to be able to learn critical reading or, you know, analysis skills and put them in a classroom with people who've been doing that since they were three, it's difficult for someone to succeed. Um, going off of what Hafsat said, um, it's, it's very important to, like, provide, like, kind of like these sort of safe spaces for students who are like underrepresented at PWIs. That's currently currently a struggle like I'm going through um, at RISD because I remember freshman year, like I would be the only black person in a group of like 20 and I would have class with all these, like the same 20 people all across all classes and be afraid to make identity pieces because I would encounter a room of silence where basically nobody didn't know how, like knew how to interact with the work I was making. So they just didn't say anything. Um, and so I think like a lot of what our community, like the black community at RISD is trying to do is like provide these spaces for people to feel um, kind of like seen and just provide like critiques for uh, different people's artworks if they want to bring it in. Um, have self-care moments. Um, like last year we did a protest, um, a sit-in, a self-care sit-in up in the administrative building in um, the Washington uh, administration floor. Um, and so it was just a day of kind of just us sitting and just making sure all of us were taking care of each other like while um, still protesting because 
the the demands that were made the prior year weren't even acknowledged by the administration. So it's kind of just a lot of like us, because we're 2.5% of RISD's um, total population, which is crazy to think at times. But I guess what we've put our energy into is making sure everybody kind of has the strength to keep making art and keep pushing for the next couple of years. Um, so at this time, I'm going to invite a man who really doesn't need an introduction. Um, so I'd like to invite SNCC veteran um, Charlie Cobb um, to be in conversation with the students. limited amount of time, I'm going to really uh, limit my involvement to two things. Uh, one, I think uh, this group sitting here at this table should be applauded by just for the simple fact that their presence here, their conversation here, refutes all of the stereotypes about young black people, you know. I mean, if you, if you, it's clear, I mean, that young black people are interested in history, in the movement of struggle, uh, you know, and that what they need is exposure to it. And that's an argument that needs to be made to our school system <laughs> more than the people sitting in this room. I also need to say, uh, um, personally, as someone who uh, was deeply involved in the Southern Freedom Movement, and in particular deeply involved with the Mississippi Movement, that I personally appreciate their interest in the movement uh, that I was involved in. That's a personal thanks from me to you. Uh, I am not going to give some long, drawn out, reflective analysis of, of, of what they've said or what they've seen or what they're showing. I do have one sort of basic question I, I want to put to them. Uh, and then hopefully people here in this audience will, will put all the other questions they may have. And it's, it's a fairly lengthy question, so not everybody needs to answer the whole thing. <laughs> you, you can take whatever piece of it you want. But basically what I'm interested in knowing from, from you all uh, is this. A new generation of, of, of activists have emerged in recent years, a lot of it in the wake of the murder of uh, Trayvon Martin in, in Santa Florida. And while I can't know uh, uh, your own involvement in this wave of activism, I don't know what level you all are involved or if you are involved, in fact, in the movement for black lives. While I can't know this, I am curious, since I know that you are aware of this, this activism, and given your own travels to the South, I'm interested in knowing, uh, in terms of what you saw, what do you find useful in what you saw to the kind of activism that is unfolding today and is impacting your own life uh, uh, today? And attached to that question is, is really another one, which is, uh, 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 and what would you advise uh, 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 schools that you attend in the way of teaching what you see in this movement that you're now uh, thinking about, what somebody here called, I forget who, called a, a full history of, of the movement. What would you advise uh, your schools to do by way of teaching this? Uh, now, if you want to tackle that, then I can sit back down. <laughs> I'm sort of at an interesting place in my school because um, 
I'm primar primarily studying art, which means like I have the option of taking like two liberal classes a semester. Um, within that, I can choose like anything from um, just to, like a wide range of subjects, but I naturally gravitate towards like black subjects. Um, so right now I'm taking like diaspora artists, and one of the problems I had with that is that often the classes are too problematic um, to even begin learning. Um, there's often like a sort of like politics within like who's teaching the class, and they often don't have like a lot of black professors even teaching these subjects or even giving that perspective, which is very important. Um, so I think something I would advise my school to do is to get more black professors to teach these courses because it, I can't explain how many times it's been very frustrating and very limiting um, to spend time in a class where it's like often we can't even get back past who the professor is. Like it, it, it very like much so affects the, the, the learning atmosphere. Um, and my school often provides like a lot of like reasons for why they can't do so, but they're not good enough. So, um, I think that one thing is we, there's a Provident Student Union and they fight for things. And um, one thing that they've been fighting for is an ethic class to be taught in all public schools, which I think is like, you know, good. But I also think that, you know, ethnic, they, they push everything together. So it's, you know, they're gonna teach us black history and Spanish history and all that. And um, I just feel like, I mean, why do I, why do, why are we all in one? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's so much history out there that we each deserve our own class in school. And it's hard, like even like on this trip, like you see us struggling to remember stuff because it's so much information that we only learned it in a couple of weeks and we still don't know everything, you know? And I feel like, um, it's hard to try to shove a, a 200 years of history into one class, and then that's only one culture. And um, I feel like in schools, that's kind of like when you do that to someone, it, they don't, we don't retain it, you know. And I feel like the first step to even making any kind of change is to be educated about what you, what change you're trying to make. So it's like, um, I honestly feel like there shouldn't be an ethnic class. There should be an African American studies class and um, a, whatever other class there should be, <laughs> um, because I, I just feel like it's it's too much information to put in one class underneath one broad, and it's kind of like just throwing it out there, like there now you're all happy, and it's like I'm not happy because that's not like who I am. Like I don't see myself as ethnic. I'm African American, you know. Um, I feel like the I always say I always say I'm like the first step to anything is educate me. I can't make any decisions. I can't fight for anything. I can't do anything if I don't know what the real cause is, if I don't know all the background information, if I don't know you know, any small detail. I feel like educating me is the biggest thing I need to know. And I feel like that's for everyone because you, know, you sound ignorant when you don't know what you're fighting for. And it kind of defeats the purpose. So I feel like that's one thing I would tell my school is that I don't want an ethnic class. I want an African-American class. Um. I'm gonna try to answer your first question, which was like, what did we see from like our travels that would be useful in today's movement? And like, I've, I've been asked this question before and my answer is always the same. And I think it's the whole concept of nonviolence. Cause like, I don't know, I feel like once violence starts, like they're just gonna be like, oh, it's just a bunch of another ignorant black people again that just want something but don't know, like, you know, it feels like we don't know what we're fighting for, but like by staying nonviolent like they did in the movement, it's like, we know, like, just like how in Greensboro, like they were getting hit by like bottles and whatnot, but they still chose to like keep their hands to themselves. And that kind of showed that, oh, this is, now that we're like inflicting this stuff on them, it doesn't phase them, so what next? So, and like, they kind of ran out of ideas. Whereas if they were to fight back, they'd be like, oh, see, like, they're just trying to create trouble. So I feel like by staying nonviolent and whatever you're trying to do, it's like probably like the best solution, especially in like a movement where we're trying to be heard. Because as soon as like the media knows how to flip things in a way where as soon as like there's one small act of violence, it's just, oh, yeah, these group of black people are just inflicting pain to society. So that's what I was thinking. Um, I agree with both Sarah and Mohamedou. Like, we should stay nonviolent because as soon as, like, someone 
does something violent, then you know they depict us in, in like that stereotype. Um, and I feel like we should have one class that's based on like African American history, and because all the classes that we have now is like European history, world history, and it's basically all just white history. Like we barely learn anything about Black history. Like all we learn is like Martin Luther King and just like a small piece of that. So I feel like if we had just one class based on like African American history, it would just help us learn more about oh how society came to be today. Um, so to answer your question as to if I could take one thing that I learned from going down south, I think it would be the sense of community. Um, going down south and sort of just meeting different activists and meeting different students and talking to them, I realized that there's a, an integral like strength that they have, like they have community and I don't feel like there's not, there's that same community, I don't think that same community is replicated here up north. Um, I think that, you know, there's community between, you know, obviously the people around you, but then also uh, the older generations and now we're going into this, you know, civil rights movement, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, the older generation, the younger generation, can we really work together? Um, so that's something that I would take is community and building that within ourselves. And then to answer your other question about the schools, um, I'm a firm believer in the bottom-up approach. Um, I think it's something to tell students that, okay, yeah, you can wait until college until you learn your first black history class, right? I think that by the time students get into college, not many people either find themselves interested or they forget. Um, kind of what Sarah was talking about, how you know the you know the ethics classes. I don't really agree with them either because you lose a lot of history when doing that. Um, but what about teaching students from a young age that from elementary school the basics and building upon them each year so that by the time they do get to college, they're ready to tackle the more problematic issues that go on or that are pervasive in societies. Um, and a way to continue that is, literally I'm plugging the Civil Rights Movement Initiative here, but going on visits and seeing these sites, because it's different to sit in a classroom and learn about something and read a textbook, and it's completely different to be in a space or talk to an activist and see kind of, you know, the uh, Bryant Grocery Store in Money, Mississippi, and to see, you know, the site, you know, in Greensboro, North Carolina, or to talk to different activists and hear their experiences, it makes it more alive. It makes history more alive. Um, and kind of, I forget, it was earlier this morning on your panel, they were talking about how to make history come alive, and that's a way to do it, because far too often am I in classes and I'm falling asleep because I am not, you know, not that I'm not engaged, because I, I guess I'm not engaged if I'm falling asleep, but there's a way to engage more students and if we want students to continue beating the drum for justice we need to teach them how to do that and we need to be awake when doing it so that everyone can live up to this woke you know like we're all woke but are we really because i'm still falling asleep in class so <laughs> yeah. i i wish we had more time indeed uh, tony i wish this was a whole conference uh, in which uh, uh, this generation could could you know, present their views, you know, because every, every one of your responses has raised in my mind more questions I'd like to pursue with you. But in deference to the ticking of the clock and to the fact of an audience out here, who, which I'm sure has questions for you, I will defer to that and, and back off uh, the scene. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we'll now we'll open the floor for questions. There's two mics in the aisle if you have a question for students. Mohamedou would like to say something. Um, <laughs> so uh, kind of building off of what Hafsat said, oh, sorry, Hafsat mm -hmm. said about community, um, my thing was, like, my thing has been, like, I always, especially in my community, I don't see a lot of males being involved in stuff. Like, for example, I think I'm the first guy to go on this trip. And, like, for example, my teaching program at Breakthrough, there's, like, two male teachers out of, like, 13 teachers. And, like, it's just we males, the young male generation is not getting involved in stuff. Whereas, like, and when they are getting involved, it's always sports or something, like, 
oh, yo, you want to play soccer after school? And I'm like, oh, no, nah, I got to go to Brown for this class. Like, oh, wow. But, like, yeah, I feel like I like I'd like to see more men involved or, like, young men involved in, like, movements and stuff like that because, like, mostly it's the women. And I feel like uh, I'm kind of being uh, contradicting because I remember Sarah used to ask me, oh, you want to join the executive board? And I'm like, mm, I don't know. So, like, our, like, <laughs> board of directors or whatever at our school is all female. There's not, like, a single male. Like, you know, it's basically, like, they're kind of, like, class presidents, co-class presidents, but there's no, like, not a single male there. So, like, even within myself, I would like to be more involved, but, like, I feel like... Uh, young men aren't being involved in anything, really, but sports. I have no clue. Because <laughs> honestly, like what he said, like it's not just when it comes to, you know, civil rights movements or anything like that. It's honestly with, a, with like everything. Like, and it's not, and it's also not just race. It's not just young black men that don't get involved. Like, like even if you think about like simple things like school, like colleges, more females are going to college than males. And it's like, it's becoming a thing that we just, I don't even know what to do. Like for the executive board, I really did want guys on it and I like asked all the guys I knew I was like join it come on and they're like no we don't want to or Muhammadu was like I'll think about it um <laughs> and it's just like I I I think the the biggest thing is that we, I don't know what to get their interest into it like I feel like they think that if they join it then other and other guys aren't joining it then they think that like it's whack or whatever like I I think it's coming to become more of a reputation thing they're more worried about their reputation than actually doing something um, and I've actually been trying to battle it, like trying to get more people involved. I mean, Muhammadu joined the trip, thanks to me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but you know, and I feel like I feel like it's honestly just trying to get them more interested in making them see that like it's not something that's girly. Like just because girls are doing it doesn't mean that it's a girl thing, or you know. And I feel like that's a big problem. That's that's the main thing is that they think that you know it's a girl thing when it's not, it's an everybody thing. And I, I really, I don't know how to battle that either, to be honest. <laughs> One of the things that I learned is that kids are, boys are sick of being told what to do by any man across the board uh, because they have no role model to follow. And there's plenty of comes in. Um, I just wanted to add at Salem State University, there is um, a group of young African-American men who um, the, the university added this. They have their flaws as a university in terms of diversity, but they have gone to national conferences. They have tried to raise that voice within the university. So I see it as an opportunity for people who are connected with universities, if this is a problem across the boards too, look for um, some of some development of something like that that would bring more voices in because they've had a powerful voice in the community and have a certain status on the campus as well. I don't necessarily have a question, but a comment and um, just a word of encouragement to say personally, I think all you guys are pretty amazing and it's inspiring, I'm sure that everybody could share, to see young people in involved and wanting to know and as you said if we expose you to it then 
who knows what could happen and grow from it. So I just want to encourage you as you guys are, you know, seniors and getting ready to go into college, it's a whole different ball game out here. And I encourage you to continue to try your voice, try to find your voice and be strong and loud and proud about it. Um, you know, I think we all understand that this talking about this, even in this conference in this room, it's frustrating sometimes and it's sometimes you don't know the answer, but I encourage you just like the activists during that time, you have their spirit. And um, already, because you're involved in this, continue to look for it, keep trying any little thing that you can. Stay strong and keep going for it because, you know, as someone who is older than you, <laughs> not by much, but um, and other people in the room, it has to keep going and we need you. Um, so I hope that you, in your heart and your mind, find a way to commune with people that, um, just like in the other panel, to self-care and keep building yourself mentally because the world out here is gonna keep trying to bring you down. And I find you guys all inspiring. I also come from a background where I didn't get this history. So I'm learning a lot now through CSSJ and um, conferences like this and you guys, you know, so, and special thanks to Maya for the organization because I think it's just a great thing. It's absolutely necessary. And I myself as an adult, not a student, I wanna take the trip. You know, it's important. And I just pray that you guys, you know, I hope that you guys stay strong and keep, I don't just stay loud and proud about it, you know? So I just hope to see that from you guys and I hope that you guys continue to um, grow and within yourselves and for this country. So um, I'd just like to piggyback. So you spoke from a clinical perspective and as an educator, you know, um, Influence and representation is real. So in regards to your question about how to get young men, when you don't have men in front of the classroom teaching, it's kind of difficult. Um, so really looking to help figure out how to get um, young men engaged with other men, you know, to try to help influence um, them to try exposure to their history and where it is that they come from is extremely important. Um, secondly, I'm proud of you. She's my sister. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> She's um, the one I talked about yesterday. And um, I miss the trip thoroughly. I'm no longer in the classroom, but I understand um, the importance of education. So I'm working on my education to figure out how it is that I can influence a system that is extremely broken. Um, so it's nice to see that you all have taken a lot from the trip um, and I hope that she continues to take it and I'll figure out how to get back in the fold somehow. Mm -hmm. But um, keep up the good fight. Okay, mom. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> you want to answer? Are you going to answer? Yes, I agree that we should teach everyone, mother. Um, everyone should know about the history because if you look back at like um, civil rights marches and things, it wasn't just people of color. There were white people that were standing with them. So I feel like once people see that it's more than just like people of color protesting, they realize that it's like, it's a bigger thing that when more than one race come together to protest. Um, also, I wanted to add, like the first thing is um, like even on the trip we went to, like I was not surprised, but like I've seen, there was a number of like white students that went there and they were like highly educated on the topic. And I was like, oh, that kind of makes me proud, you know, like they know what, what they're talking about. And also, what's I gotta say again? 
Oh, yeah. I think it is best to educate all people because, like, for example, I always think about, like, Andy Goodman, I think his name was, who mm -hmm. was, like, yeah. Yeah, so, like, he was he was also, like, a white man helping, you know, the movement. And I also, uh, so my girlfriend, she's white, right? And, like, she, <laughs> she's, like, she's, I see, like, I feel like she's really educated on, like, stuff like this because, like, for example, sometimes, she's, like, she'd be like, oh, yo, that, I think that guy, it was being kind of racist to you and I'm like oh no I think he was just in a bad mood like no you can't just like you can't just give them an excuse all the time like you, you got to know when it's present I was like oh wow it's like she knows her stuff you know so it's like it's good to know that like there are white people that like are with us and I was gonna say one more thing but I forgot I might be over here but so yes to answer your question I think that it's important to educate um people from all walks of life about the topics that we're talking about. But something that I'm like struggling with is how do you teach somebody who doesn't want to learn, you know? So like it's one thing to say that we want to go out there and teach all these people who are making all these executive decisions, but not all these people want to learn about what we're trying to teach. So I had an answer to your question and I'm throwing it back with another question. And I don't know if anyone can like provide insight to that. Oh, I remember. I'm going to answer that first one. <laughs> and then I'm Yours, because okay. I think so. I just went to. I'm going to PC upcoming fall, and I went to this um, night in Friar Sound where I like stayed on campus, and I had a mentor. I had a mentor um, host, and it was a freshman on campus, and she's black. And um, one thing she said to me was like, "You just need to be aware that as an African American on this campus, as a person of color, you got to work three times as hard as these other kids." And she was like, "I mean, I can't skip one class." Like, they noticed me for one, but then she was just like, you know, I see these these white kids and, you know, they party every night and they don't do their homework and they live their lives and they still pass. And yet me, I got to work three times as hard just to prove that I can fit in, that I can make it here, you know? And I think that um, we should educate people, but not because like, oh, you're being racist, you need to be educated, but because you don't even know you're being racist. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You don't even know that I'm struggling three times as hard because you're unaware because people have told you racism is gone. Everyone is equal now. So like there's white kids who are sitting there not even noticing that there's a black kid in the back of the class who's the only black kid who has to work three times as hard. So that, I think that's the biggest reason that I think, you know, other people, Everybody should be educated, not because you know they're they're physically being unaware, but because they literally just are so ignorant and not it's not their fault, you know. Um, so that's what I think, and I also think like on to half that it is true that there's some people that are ignorant on purpose, you know. I feel like um, it's hard to I feel, just like me, it was hard for me to come to terms that I was ignorant um, about my own history. I feel like it's hard for some people to understand that like you know, your ancestors were messed up, man. You know, like they don't want to come to terms that, you know, they're they're white and they do have privileges. Like I have I have a friend who um who who's super like, you know, she she's white and um she's like, no, you know, I'm not racist. I've grew I grew up around all these da 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 da. You know, I'm I'm just like you, I'm poor and all that. And I'm like, but you have to understand that you're white and I'm black. At the end of the day, when you get out of poverty, you're still gonna be white. You know what I mean? So like I feel like you know, you know, even though she she's she understands my history, she's not really like learning it because she's she doesn't understand like you know the skin color changes the way that I view the history and the way you view my history. And if you can't take a step onto my side and look at the way I view the history, then we're never gonna really learn, you know, each other's history. Like you're never gonna understand my side of the way. And I think that's going to be a huge problem because like there's people who aren't racist but they really can't look at the other side of the shoe and see why I would be mad you know that uh, I have to work three times as hard in class so. oh sorry so Imani's mom asked about like she was saying how like this could go into the job market and all that and I just thought of this thing where Again, a story about my girlfriend again, but she was like, oh, it's always, like, for some reason, the stats say that women are, like, the most in college and stuff, but somehow the best jobs are always going to rich, privileged white men. She was like, why is that? And, like, I didn't even have an answer for that. And I was like, and, like, 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 like I said, she's white, so, like, she, she's aware of these issues. And, I, and she goes to, like, a predominantly colored, like, you know, because she's, like, one of the only white kids in her school. So, like, 
I guess like like she was saying, like Sarah was saying, like she understands, but like she can't really be like us. So I get that. But like she's like like that kind of that question. Like I still think about it. Like you know, like there's mostly women in college, but the economy is like the richest people are like privileged white men. So it's like I don't know. Yeah, that's just what I thought of when she asked about like the job market and everything. One last question before we, yeah. Uh, Charlie Cobb has been in the movement for over 50 years, and you're still engaged in struggling. I just want to get a sense from you over the next five to 10 years, what kinds of things you think that you're going to be passionate about that's going to keep you going in the struggle as long as Charlie's been in it? Mm -hmm. Um, I have answers quick sometimes. <laughs> I had a, because <laughs> um, I I'm going to school for English. That's going to be my major, and um, I've been struggling if I wanted to be a teacher. You know, I because I really like education, and um, and I and I realized that like I did tutoring with Muhammadu for a little while, but I had to drop out of it because I had to I had to do other things, and um, I think that. If I what, five to ten years, one thing I do want to do is teach. Like, it, whether it's getting into an English class and like teaching the curriculum that I'm supposed to teach and slipping in some African American stuff. Like, I don't care what I have to do. I just feel like, like just like Hafsa said, like I didn't have any background information. You know what I mean? Like, I had a little bit of here, and then that was it. And I feel like a build up is important. Like, even the smallest smidget can go a long way you know like like I mean with Maya we didn't learn everything we can possibly learn about the civil rights movement but I learned enough that like it stuck in my head and I'm and I'm gonna remember it and I'm gonna want to learn more like I want to learn more and I want if I can just give any any kid that like that small smidget for them to want to take it and like run with it I mean that's what I do because like I said I feel like you know teaching them like opening it up to opening the conversation and giving me the tools to learn for myself is like one of the biggest things I want to do. And I know that I just know that it'll go a long way. I know that it'll it'll make changes happen. Like because if we're not educated, like and we can't not even just about the history, but about the present. And like because if you can't if you don't know your past and your present, you can't you can't affect your future. And I feel like for me personally, that's one thing I really want to do. Like, and no matter what I'll do, I'm thinking about being a publisher. Like, whatever I'm doing, I really just want to make sure that the material that's getting out there is something that'll make a kid like me, 17 year old, be like, I want to, I want to do something with it. Um, five to ten years. Um, it's kind of hard to think about. Um, I've been thinking a lot about like breaking into these spaces, um, like art spaces where black people weren't traditionally allowed to be in, like the museum world. Um, even museums are just kind of not very inclusive spaces as much as they try to be. Um, I'm kind of like in a weird place of like where I want to take my art and even though I'm like doing apparel, I'm like, hey, I still like making paintings and I still like drawing and I'm still kind of interested in like, cur like curatorial work and museums and figuring out like why there isn't much to say about like African cultures and how they're kind of like just lumped together. Um, just I'm, I'm still kind of just wondering like how to navigate these spaces myself. So I'm, I can't say for sure that, hey, I wanna uh, curate this museum and specifically be in like the textiles department of the RISD museum or something. But um, I think it's just kind of by like inserting my presence into these spaces and kind of seeing what I can learn, but also what I can give and kind of sort of like not educate them, but sort of just kind of change the atmosphere a little bit. So I'm not sure. Uh, five to ten years is a long time, um, but you know I. <laughs> so I guess fifty years is a really long time, um, but you know I, I'm struggling because I came into college thinking that I was going to be a journalist and I was really passionate. I was like, yes, I'm I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, um, and then I started taking international relations classes and I was like, whoa, this is really really cool. And then minoring and coupling it with African American studies. It's got me thinking about all these different things, and I feel like at this point in time, there's just so many different 
things going on that it's very hard to kind of just hone in on one and say that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, one thing that I am certain of is that I want to continue fighting for justice, equality, freedom, the rights that we, you know, the inalienable rights that we were supposed to have, but really have. Um, and the more that I invest myself into school, because that's all I'm kind of really doing right now, uh, the more that I see that I want to tackle the disparities and the, the, the differences between education, you know? And then kind of just looking at that and looking at education, I see the intersectionality between education and healthcare, uh, the intersectionality between education and like housing and wealth. And it makes it difficult because I feel like you can't just fight one battle, you have to fight multiple battles. And it makes the, it makes it really hard. And, you know, I've been, you know, in my long experiences, you know, at life and college, I've been understanding that, you know, I've been trying to tackle so many things. And I feel like because I've been tackled, trying to tackle so many things, I've been ineffective in doing so, um, rather than focusing my efforts on one thing and being effective in that. But I can't pick one thing because there's so much going on and kind of piggybacking what, of, what Jer of what Sarah said and um, understanding that if we can educate students so that they can feel an inch or a per a one percent of what we feel, it'll motivate them to kind of use their knowledge to influence their passions, if that makes sense, so that I won't need to struggle between trying to fight the healthcare system, the education system, the housing system, the busing system, but other people will be doing that themselves, right? And I can focus on one issue, and then someone who's motivated or who wants to be a doctor can focus on that issue, or a data analyst, or an English teacher, or an artist, and they can all focus on their aspects of life, and then we can all build this big, wonderful community, and then, you know, move it towards that post-racial society, if we'll ever get there, um, that everyone talks about. <clears throat> Um, personally, like in these past few months as college is approaching, like I've my mind been all my mind has been all over the place on like what exactly I want to study, because like right now I'm in for like as an accounting major, but like I've been thinking like oh maybe I want to do something more math related, so I was like maybe I should just major in mathematics or major in like finance, which is kind of more math than like you know doing accounting or something. So then. That's that. I was like, oh yeah, I like math. So that's what I want to do. But I'm like, how's math? How's the math I do gonna help other people? So I was like, oh, maybe I should like you know study finance and then go to law school and then like you know like help people with their finances or you know stuff like that. Well, like I'm just so confused. So I I'm really not sure. But like when I went to the school I'm going to, Boston College, I went there like for a weekend and like. It was like a multicultural weekend, basically, and like all the you know African Americans that were there are doing this. Like most of them are doing their own majors, and then they're minoring in something called African and African Diaspora Studies, which is like pretty new at BC. But like I don't know, I'm thinking about doing maybe something like that, and then like you know just trying to mix my passions because I'm not really sure exactly what I want to do at this point. Because like I thought I was sure, but now I'm like I don't know, man. <laughs> Um, for me, I'm not really sure like what I'm gonna do in the next five to ten years, but I know I want to like educate myself in the history, like take classes to learn more, and I also want to use my photography to like be a kind of activist, I guess, like be an activist through my photography. I mean, that's just one thing I'm thinking about. Um, so thank you all for this stimulating panel. And <laughs> I know how much you all love to sing. <laughs> um, and so thinking about the program and um, the impact it has had on students, um, I'm also reminded that I need to think about what um, we need to give back to the trip. And so as a way to pay respect um, to all the activists we meet throughout the trip and all the sites that we stop at, uh, music was very important to the civil rights movement. Um,
And we always sing when we're with activists and we always sing when we're at Sunflower County Freedom Project or Rosedale Freedom Project. Um, and so whenever students do speak about the movement and what it has, has been to them, it is only right that we, we close in song um, before we um, close with remarks from Professor Bogues. So I ask that you all join us in singing Woke Up This Morning with My Mind Set on Freedom. And I'll ask Cortland and Charlie to come on stage and sing with us. <laughs> and, and I'm not a singer. Um, Professor Gusto, could you please join us? I also see Pablo, who was on the trip my second year, who came from one of the high schools in Baltimore. Would you like to join us? <laughs> Mission A, please join us. Gonna ask everyone to stand. <laughs> so we we all talked about how the struggle continues and there's a lot of work ahead of us. And I always use this quote by James Bevel, who once said, "You could tell um, whether or not the young people were ready by how they sang." Um, so I hope you keep that in mind as as we do sing. Set on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind. Set on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind. Set on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 I woke up. Let me just, I will try and, as I try and wrap up, um, let me just say that, um, that this is the, when we were conceptualizing this conference, um, Shana, Maya, and myself, and we were trying to think of how to end it, um, and we went back and forth uh, about a week about how to end it for a couple of days. And then we hit upon the idea of ending the, this particular conference um, with uh, the group of uh, high school kids that she had worked with. And I think when we hit upon that idea, we all said, okay, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's how we should end it. Um, and I don't think any of us uh, 
ex, you know, the, the, what has happened, the inspiration, the, 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 the questions, the ways in which they have answered and they have participated in this and then ending in song is really um, a great way to end this. Um, and I think we also owe, we owe Maya a great deal for this kind of work that she has done. And I want to thank Charlie Cobb who f for agreeing because we then thought, okay, we needed somebody to interact from the, from the movement. And I, I, I said, let's ask Charlie Cobb. We didn't even tell him, we just put him on the program. And then from he came here, he says, I noticed I'm on the program to talk. What am I supposed to say? <laughs> so I want, to, I want to thank you, Charlie, for, for stepping in at the last minute. <clears throat> This has been, um, for us at the, the center, a uh, really very important uh, conference. And so I want to begin by thanking everyone again for attending. We people, Some people were here yesterday, some are not here, so on, but I would like to thank everyone for attending. So uh, to, uh, to also would like to thank all the uh, participants, all the presenters, and all the moderators um, for doing their work. And then obviously, um, really would also like to thank the CSSJ team that organized it, uh, Maya and, um, and, and, and Shana, as well as the student workers who worked with us. I also would like to thank Media Services, the two gentlemen, um, somebody, there was somebody else here yesterday, and there's another gentleman here working today, so I would like to thank the media services people uh, for coming. This is a part of a three-part event, that set of events that we are planning for our fifth anniversary. This one, um, and then the other two would be a, in, on September, September 21, would be a civil rights exhibition um, called Unfinished Civil Rights Movement, Unfinished Business. And then sometime in November, we will, in, uh, in, in uh, working with the Center for the Race and Study of Race and Ethnicity, do a major international conference, which we're just calling Race Today. I think so that, and that will close off the year for us at the Center as uh, the kind of events that we, were, we want to do um, to, for our fifth anniversary. I think that what is clear is that <clears throat> for us at the center, the question of anti-black racism is really foundational to the United States, to its founding, and to the ongoing project of what constitutes America today. It is, as I said, in my opening remarks on Monday, uh, part of the foundation of the symbolic order of United States. And that in trying to think about that and work against that symbolic order, the question of history is very important. History, both as a visual kind of representation that we see in monuments or that we see in museums, or does the history that is taught in schools and indeed at universities. And that all these histories, no matter how we learn them and how they are represented, are essentially, ev ev essentially evoke a set of meanings about the society in which we live. And therefore, one of the things that becomes very clear to us is that the non-teaching of history and the, the hashtag for this particular conference you may not have noticed is called Unsilencing History. That's the hashtag for this. And one of the things, reason why we do that is because we think that this question of history is so fundamental to the narrative of what we understand this country and what we understand ourselves uh, to be. And therefore, it is clear listening to everybody for the last two days that one of the things that we need to do or continue to do is to think about how can we engage in this business of history, of making history accessible 
making history or certain kind of history um, uh, as available to people. So therefore, there are two things in relationship to that that this center will do going into our, our the next five years. The first is that we will, con we will convene a public history workshop around public history. And we want to do this simply because there is in the academy a vast distinction between what is public history and what is academic history. We want to break that dichotomy. And we want to be able to work with the best scholars and best community historians in trying to think about that relationship and then trying to think about how can we do public history. We listen to Kanye West and the nonsense he speaks. And some of us are angry with him because he's such a fine artist and so on. But at the same time, he might be represented, representative of a certain widespread ignorance in the society around some of the questions, not of Trump, that's his business, but of the business, but of the questions of slavery and the meaning of slavery to America. And therefore, it would seem to us that to think about how to do public history, how to, why, how to collapse the gaps between public history and what is called academic history is important. And secondly, how to do that history from what Charlie talks about from the inside out. In other words, to change the ways in which we think about the writing of history that would allow us to get to history, what some, some of us call bottom up get to history that does not focus just on heroes, but focuses on ordinary people and the power and the strength of ordinary people in changing society and making, and indeed making history. So that's the first project that we will try and do. The second project really emerges out of what the young people have said to us yesterday and today. And that is that we began a project around the business of digital history for high schools. We began it and we kind of faltered because you know we're growing and we're doing a couple of many other things and, and so on and you have to get people to come on who are graduate students and then they have to go and do other things. But it's now very clear to me, listening both to panels yesterday and today the, the panel and the panel today, that we, re, we need to revisit that project and make it one of the central projects of the center. So that the question was, so there are two historical projects. One is about doing public history, but this is on which we do, and we'll do that by exhibitions, and we will continue to do it in, in the best ways we can. But the second one is to foreground a digital history project, which will be a digital history first for Rhode Island State, and then to see work with teachers all over to see if we cannot get a digital history project. Because the, the thing, the question, that project is around, the digital history project for schools is about African American history. But one of the things that we need to understand is that African American history is also American history. It, it is not in a, some kind of small cubby hole. That African American history tells the story of this nation, but tells it from a certain perspective. So our second major project, which I'm announcing, would be around digital, we'll be trying to do a digital history for, um, for teaching purposes. The third project, and we tend to be task oriented at the center. That is, we listen, we try to talk to people, we do, we do a lot of intellectual work, but a lot of the intellectual work is then connected to a set of tasks that we try to do. The third project emerges from yesterday and emerges from a question that was asked by a member of the audience to, uh, to a panel. When the person said, I am from Brazil, do you all have a connections with international people? And he asked that of the panelists who were here, uh, young, young people who were here yesterday as well. And they said no. And it immediately struck me, listening again to the panelists of, of young people, that one of the things we needed to do was to think about the international conference of young activists that would begin to, so that they can begin to talk to each other. We are a center of slavery and justice. What many of us don't know is that the, and the abolitionist movement, the black abolitionist movement to abolish slavery, 
was not just an American movement, was not just a Caribbean movement, was not just about a revolution in Haiti. But if you look at the records of the 19th century, the black abolitionist movement was the very first international reformist movement in the world. They had meetings in Europe, they had meetings in America, they had meetings in the Caribbean. In other words, they were attempting to think about one of the most important social problems of the, of the 19th century, which was slavery. And so slavery wasn't just an American or Caribbean or Latin American phenomenon. The international people, the colonial empires were involved. And therefore, it meant that those who were black abolitionists who were thinking about trying to abolish it were in conferences all the time trying to think about how we can abolish this. It would therefore seem to me, in keeping with that tradition, that if you have a set of young people who are trying to think about how to change the world, it might be useful for a center that's called itself slavery and justice to think about how can you then bring in young people internationally together to think about that, 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 particular, uh, that particular question. So that therefore, coming out of this conference of two days, what I would like to announce are those three particular projects that we will do. In the end, I would just want to say thanks again to, uh, to, to everybody. But I would also just want to say that basically what we have tried to do here is essentially pull together young people, scholars, activists, in trying to set up a set of conversations about race, about race and memorialization, history and memory in America. That we do that, not from the, just the perspective of this is a nice academic conference to do, but we do it very mindful that what we are doing at the center is operating within a certain black tradition in this country and elsewhere around organizing, around thinking about thought, around thinking about intervention, around thinking about what really is critical intellectual work as opposed to just academic protocols. What is critical intellectual work that can, in fact, change the world and to, make, to use the words that everybody likes to use, make a difference. So once again, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I want to again thank all the participants or thank the organizers. I see people who have been here for two days running. I want to thank you especially if you've been here for two days running. Um, and basically to say to you all, we, I look forward to working with everybody, including the young, people, the young babies that were here. I look forward to working with everybody in, uh, in what we consider to be a, a real, real project over the next five years around questions of history and around questions of, of connecting young people in some kind of understanding of the global and the way in which we all have to work together to make the difference. Thank you all very, very much for the parties, for the, for the presenters. If I'm to my, am I right? Shane, am I right? The food is there. I, I, for, um, for the presenters, um, the meal is over at the CSSJ. Thank you all very much. Thank you.